Hi everyone, my name is Kenton Shimazaki and I'm a news executive at the Harvard Crimson. Our second to last event is a plenary session titled Essential Verification Tools for Reporting in the Internet Age. Today, I'm happy to welcome Amy Reinhardt, who is a digital founder of the New York Times' website and has worked online since 1996 for newspapers, magazines, and nonprofits. Currently, she is a manager of training and international projects at First Draft. First Draft is a project of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. First Draft provides basic verification training for journalists and uses research-based methods to fight misinformation and disinformation online. Amy Reinhardt will explain how to trace digital footprints, how to set up your desktop, how timestamps on social platforms work, and how to verify location and image video authenticity. We'll also discuss ethical and copyright considerations when using user-generated content and reporting. Please help me in welcoming First Draft's Amy Reinhardt. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll keep, well, we'll go through it, but I know this is your last session, so um, uh, your patience may be waning. But um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I wanted to get a show of hands uh, for people who are using, um, in your newsroom right now, uh, using um, user-generated content. For your, do, do you know what I mean by that? User-generated content? How about um, the word verification when it comes to online? No? Um, and have you taken any classes that have included that? Okay. You guys are in the right place. Um, so thanks for stopping by. Um, this is something we feel should be critical in every newsroom and in every journalism school. People should, be knowing, people should know how to verify that Emma Gonzalez did not rip up the Constitution. That's the kind of stuff that we're talking about. So uh, there's fact checking, which to me is sort of like the old school grandma version of, of this. And then there's verification, which is the hip new cousin, which takes a look at, you know, fact checking looks at author, um, authoritative sources, something that's been printed or said by a public figure. And verification looks at um, things that you might have posted online. You know, can we verify that authentic the authenticity of that photo? Are you know, were you at the Parkland shooting? Is that uh, did that take place at that time and that date? So, first draft uh, fights misinformation in three ways. We do experimental projects. Uh, right now, uh, I'm leading the Brazil election project that we'll be doing. We'll be getting together about 25 newsrooms to look at misinformation around that election. We're very curious about Brazil uh, because it's highly polarized and has a high adoption of social media. And they also use WhatsApp a lot. Um, we also do groundbreaking research around those. So oftentimes newsrooms are way too busy to, uh, to experiment and then to uh, figure out what worked and what didn't. So we want to tell newsrooms what works in these kind of, uh, in these kind of scenarios. Then we also do educational resources. So I give talks like this, so does Claire and a couple of other people uh, for First Draft, and we also put together um, an online training course. So these are the various types of things that we've done. We've, uh, we've done an election project in the UK, in France, in Germany. Uh, we come up with, together with resources and an online curriculum and uh, write groundbreaking research like the um, information disorder from the Council of Europe. And these are the seven types of mis- and disinformation that Claire Wardle, uh, who runs First Draft, has developed. These are the conversations she would rather have us talking about rather than calling something fake news. Oftentimes when people use the term fake news, it's meant to erase the validity of every piece of information out there. <coughs> if we can really narrow down uh, and decide and call something what it is, whether it's imposter content, fabricated content, or satire and parody, if we can call it that rather than calling something fake news, which is probably the last time you'll hear me say that in this, in this uh, in this talk today, uh, we want to get rid of that term fake news because it's been rendered meaningless. So the intro to social verification. <clears throat> so you guys have probably seen some of these hoaxes going around. And BuzzFeed is very good at uh, kind of assembling what types of uh, problematic content have been uh, sent out. The problem is when uh, an organization like the New York Times is uh, fooled into thinking that Dylan Roof loves My Little Pony or um, that Anna Arnheim uh, uploaded a photo that she had received on WhatsApp, but she was, uh, she was given credit 
about, through a bunch of other news organizations saying that this was her viral video taken in the Brussels uh, shooting, or bombing, I think. Um, and Fox News also reported on, we always have these, uh, this very famous shark who has been around since Hurricane Sandy, keeps circulating through. You're, I see you nodding your head, so you've seen that before? Yeah, he will make an appearance in almost every uh, hurricane or natural disaster. So we're seeing that after something like Parkland shooting, um, after uh, we have a natural disaster that involves any kind of water, uh, you're going to see the same types of, of um, recirculated content. So before using content you find online, do you know the one thing we want everybody to look at is the provenance. Is this piece an original piece of content? And the source, who captured it? The location, where was it captured? The date and time, when it was captured? Which is different from the upload time. And the motivation, why was it captured? And if you look through this list, you'll see there are very familiar questions to journalism. It's who, what, when, where, why. With, uh, with also, too, you would also check as a journalist the authenticity or the, the source of, of um, the information that you would be, be getting. You wouldn't incorporate any information into your report that didn't include uh, source information. So we're going to dip briefly into how to find this. Um, <clears throat> and why originals matter. So there are two big reasons. One is usage permission and the other is verification. So if you don't know if something, um, if photo or video is original, uh, you don't know who to ask. You know, who can I, can I use this uh, video, Anna Arenheim from Brussels? And she'll say, I was in Israel during that time. I was nowhere near that. And then you say, okay, we won't credit her for that. Just like you would any other piece of content that you would include in your reporting. It's also the ethical component that you want to consider too. That you, if it was your photo, you would want to be asked. You would at least want to know what, uh, where you're going to see this photo again. Um, <clears throat> and maybe a little payment. Some people want payment for their stuff, and, and if you're not going to receive it, you, you have the right to withhold that information. Um, and then you can't do proper verification. If you don't know who to go to to ask um, where this information came from, you won't know how to verify uh, that piece of content. So you want to evaluate the <coughs> uploaders. So if you go to a site or you see a piece of content and it looks like it's uh, done professionally, and you go to their social media post or to their YouTube channel, is this uh, content congruent with what they've already produced? Are they in the same location? Is it the same quality? Um, is there an obvious financial motivation to content? We see this a lot with YouTube, where there are national, natural disaster web, uh, channels. And what they do is they scrape, which is uh, downloading and then uploading again as their own, uh, natural disaster videos. And every time some, uh, a big natural disaster happens, every time you click on it, you, they make money on it. So that's, that's a, uh, there's a financial motivation to, oftentimes for people to uh, repost this stuff. So you also want to check and see if the uploader has online accounts. Are they on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook? Have they hidden themselves? Are they on LinkedIn? That's often, a, that's often where I go to check first sometimes to see um, what their title is, where they've been. Because people, I think, are more forthcoming in LinkedIn than probably any other uh, social platform because people want to be seen there. <coughs> And does the uploader refer to being at the scene, or do they say, I've got this great video? Do they say, I saw this happen? You won't believe this, uh, what happened in this photo or video. And is the content and description uh, consistent with other reports you've read elsewhere? So if you're hearing something that's, not to, that's totally unbelievable, and you would, you would do a quick Google search probably to see, and if, it, and if it's like, no, that's, that didn't happen in, that's in the place where they're saying it was, then, then you know that this, this information is, uh, is something to be looked at closer. So you want to do a social audit of people. Uh, in this case, we're using Casey. And his, his profile is consistent on YouTube, on Twitter, <laughs> and, he's off, um, and he's verified, and on Instagram, and on LinkedIn. So that's a, pers that's a place where you, those are the, the uh, tracks that you want to connect, make sure. Sometimes people have uh, different usernames on their profiles, but they should have some kind of consistency, especially if it is like in, that, in this one, he's a professional photographer. He, again, wants to be seen. So to evaluate Twitter accounts, uh, you can search, do an advanced search. Twitter has a very good internal search. Uh, you can search uh, people. You can then search dates. 
Uh, you can also look at when the account was set up. You can check uh, earlier tweets. Again, are they consistent with what uh, this person talks about? Sometimes people on profiles, they talk about two or three things consistently. Is that happening here? Um, where are they tweeting from? Sometimes you, know, you can set your Twitter account to wherever you want to be. Are they saying that they're somewhere else? Who do they follow? Who follows them? Do they have an interaction? Is, he, is this person just you know, following a million people and there's no interaction? Is it a bot? That's something to look at. Um, and are there links to other social profiles? People in their profile often put their, the link to their blog or, uh, or other pages that are pertinent. And are profile photos original or from somewhere else? Again, a quick reverse image search will show you. Does anybody watch um, the MTV show Catfish? Yes. Okay. <laughs> they do. Okay. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about verification. I love catfish. They often have really great uh, ways to check somebody's footprint. And uh, this is a classic thing. So consider this like an upgraded version of catfish. Uh, but there, um, you want to look at the original photo, photo. So you know what I'm talking about, right? OK. Um, there's also searching Facebook. Facebook, if you guys have uh, searched it uh, yourselves, it's a really clunky search engine. So we don't recommend uh, using that. Um, there's a website uh, with a headless person at the top, but that is actually a private investigator. And he has assembled this website uh, that has all of these tools that you can use for free. Um, there's also people find Thor. It's a little, um, a little less complicated, but still an uh, a powerful alternative. And um, what's great about Intel techniques is once you get somebody's, everybody on Facebook has a unique ID. Once you get that in there, you can populate it in these fields. You can see where people um, have, where they've been tagged in photos. And that's, this is kind of the first start um, when you're looking up for some, when you're looking somebody up, uh, especially associated with a breaking news situation, that's how people find, you know, Dylan Roof's best friends and their cousins and all that because he's had it, he has it all um, available. I think uh, journalists were really mystified by the Las Vegas shooting because that person uh, didn't have any digital footprint and was like, how could this be? But you know, he's older; he didn't adopt it uh, for whatever reason. Did Did you have a question back there? OK, if you guys have questions through some of this, I, we can pause. Anybody? So with the information you're able to gather from Intel techniques, is that, um, does that depend on sort of the uh, privacy settings that the user has uh, yes. on their account? So what you want the world to do is to not lock down their privacy settings. What you want to do is to lock down yours. And it's not enough just to say that you only want to show your posts to friends. You also need to um, shut off this, the facial recognition, which is a separate is in a separate location, the privacy settings. You also want to what was new this week. Uh, there's been so much with Facebook. But there's, there are about three different places within Facebook that you have to uh, shut off to the public. Um, and I recommend when you go home, you see how much of your information is publicly available, uh, especially those of you who will be looking for jobs. Um, it might be good to be a little less visible to people who you don't want to look. But again, we want people to be as wide open as possible. That's part of the Cambridge Analytica uh, problem is that people who left their settings wide open, I'm thinking of my mom uh, and most of my family who don't do this professionally, that they, they're wide open. Um, so if you do due diligence on these digital footprints, uh, you can do what the Washington Post did, which is stop a hoax. Um, there was a, a person who approached the, po uh, the Post. Does anybody remember this story? Yes. OK. Yes. So yeah. I mean, that's, that was a classic case of, of a journalist using every tool at their advantage and really going after this person and saying, we can't, we've already seen, I think there was a GoFundMe page that said she was going, she wanted funding to go to New York to fool MSM. So there we have it. That's, that's, the, uh, that's where we are right now in the world. <clears throat> so content verification. So it's good to familiarize yourself uh, with Google Maps and Google Earth. Um, has anybody played with the little yellow man on the, when you're looking up something on Google Map? It can be a little frustrating because that little man can often slip off and you, you're not sure where you're pointed. But it's really good, especially for historical imagery. Um, oops. How did I do that? You go back? Uh. Oh, did I? Oh, I did do that. On the, the other direction. Uh-huh. I'm doing the other direction. Do you have it? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think it was a number of fingers. <laughs> um, so the cool thing about Google Maps 
um, is that there's historical image. And why does that matter? Well, when there are dictators around the world who said there was no bombing, there was no gas attack, you can actually look at before and after images and say that building does not exist anymore or that building is now a bunch of rocks. Um, that's how this stuff is so critical. And we've had one uh, uh, dictator backpedal on, well, maybe there was something that had happened there. And that's the kind of stuff that we're getting into. The people who do this professionally, and I'm thinking of uh, Malachi Brown um, at the New York Times and um, Elliot Higgins at Bellingcat, they are able to break stories around this stuff. You know, they were able to, uh, Malachi had um, a story that he, he was able to trace um, weapons that were um, ammunition that was that was made in I think western uh, the uh, western island on Italy and shipped to Syria and then they were able to take uh, photos and zero and get so close in on that to refine it to see that the serial numbers matched with the shipping records so all of this stuff is how he's putting together stories so it's not just looking up uh, if you can use this photo it's like putting together a really massive story so that's that's where this is all headed, and that's what the best in the business um, are doing right now. <clears throat> and as much as uh, I like Google, um, there are lots of other places or other websites uh, to do uh, searches for maps. And for instance, Yandex is better in Russia than it is um, than Google is. So there's there are certain uh, places that have just better uh, maps. Um, Wikimapia uh, is user um, edited. And, but you can filter by category, you can filter by restaurant or library, um, but it is user edited. So you have to see that as a lead, but not necessarily a verified piece of information. So what to look for? Um, when we look at photos or videos of a breaking news event, the center of the frame often has the action, right? There's this truck, the, uh, the truck going down the road, people getting shot, people running and so we're always looking at that focal point but what you really want to do when you're verifying photos or videos is you want to look at the frame and you want to see the things the architectural details that are always there and static so that you can say when someone says oh this photo was taken at the Brussels airport you can say actually it was taken there like we can we can verify through street maps that this is where they said it was the, where they said it was taken because you can again look at the look at the things that are always there the architectural details the dome in the back of the top right photo that kind of stuff or street signs are often a very good indicator of where something uh, might have been taken. <clears throat> Google Street View. Do you guys use Google Street View? Okay. Um, panning, tilting, and following streets. Um, <clears throat> You can look and follow the route and uh, take it in a video. That's why when we get to how to set up, it's really great to have more than one screen so that you can, uh, you can view uh, each thing simultaneously. So you can take the route that somebody else might have taken in the video. Um, so the um, time travel. Uh, many locations have historical imagery available. Um, and in Google Maps, that's true in the top left corner. But it's not true in Google. Google Earth can only do the aerial view. It can't go uh, deeper for the historical. And Wikimappy, as I mentioned, has themed layers, and, uh, but it allows people to edit um, that. So just use that with caution. And then there's geotagging. Uh, I think fewer than 5% of people using Twitter now actually have geolocation geoloca set on their, on their phone. I think um, just people got smarter about not wanting to be tracked like that. <coughs> So when someone says that, um, that they are somewhere, especially in Instagram, they can be anywhere. Um, and sometimes people can do a very specific um, location, like a city or even um, a, an area in that city, or it can be general, just a country. So it only works if the, setter, if the uploader has the settings turned on and they select it. And it can help, but it's not proof. And tags. And the EXIF data, uh, that's the information that usually travels with a photo until it's uploaded uh, to a social platform. Once it's uploaded to a social platform, all of that information is stripped. What we're trying to do to work with the platforms is to get them to have that information uh, continue on. That would make most journalists' uh, lives a lot easier who are verifying information. But that EXIF data can also be manipulated. So date and timestamps. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but there, um, each one of these platforms has a different mechanism for displaying their time. 
So Twitter, it's the uh, time and date uh, that are, you, are your, in your Twitter settings. And in Facebook, it's on your computer device. So if you are going to London, your timestamp for any post that you make on Facebook will be London time. Um, YouTube, it, the, date, uh, the date stamp is for Pacific Standard Time. And Instagram is Pacific Standard Time and UTC. Uh, why this matters, <laughs> we had, uh, there was a video that had been uploaded uh, from Syria, and uh, there was a bombing there, and Putin said, well, that's impossible because that, that uh, the video time does not correspond, the upload time does not correspond with when the bombing actually happened. It's like, well, it does if that server is located in Pacific Standard Time, and that's the date that it, or the date and time that it reflects. <clears throat> so Twitter. The time can be uh, seen um, in the static tweet or by hovering over. All of these social platforms, and I'm sure you know this, uh, have different ways of behaving on desktop and mobile. So if you want uh, more information, you can hover over on a desktop um, on the time. They'll usually give like it was uploaded three hours ago, and you can get the exact time that it was. Uh, let's see here. So the list, you can also uh, look at the list and the, and the privacy settings of, of yourself to make sure um, that you have had your time stamps correct on your Twitter feeds. Um, <clears throat> for YouTube, if you copy the URL into a YouTube data, feed, uh, data viewer, and it's just uh, the, well, you see it there, but it's the, the, the last part of it. You copy paste it into YouTube data viewer and you hit go, and it will tell you the time that that video was uploaded or started uploading, and it will, t it will give you five still frames, which will allow you to do a, a Google reverse image search to see if uh, that's the original photo. Um, the importance of the Amnesty International YouTube data viewer is that it shows the start time that it was uploaded, because sometimes these videos are being uploaded in places where internet is spotty, it goes out a lot, or it's just very slow. So it's important to know when that time uh, started, especially if you're doing uh, breaking news or more investigations um, in very problematic parts of the world. Um, again, Facebook operates a, a lot like how, uh, how Twitter does, um, where if you hover, you get a more exact time. And Instagram, they are tricky. So you have to go to the bottom right corner, to the three dots, and you have to select embed. And then uh, it's copy embed code. And then you'll get this long, big list. But right down here um, are the dates and time that it was um, uploaded. <clears throat> so in general, it's easier to tell that a video is not new. Um, what do I mean by that? What I mean is um, that to verify that something is original is difficult, but to just say it's not, this isn't the first time we've seen it is a lot easier. And you can look for earlier versions through keywords and reverse image searches. Uh, the thumbnail images from the YouTube data viewer that I mentioned. Um, you can check uh, descriptions and com comments. Is it something that's been reposted? Is it, has it been what we call a scrape, uh, which is taken down from somebody else's website and then uploaded as your own? Um, and unique identifier codes to find tweets. And to look for other video from the scene, just to do a comparison. Uh, does anybody use TweetDeck here to monitor? Oh, great. How do you guys use TweetDeck? Um, well, we use it to um, both, like, work with all of our Twitter accounts as well as um, monitor certain like accounts like the university's account, um, the comms director's account, uh, various professors who are online. And what university are you Princeton. On? Princeton. Okay. So if there was a breaking news event, or you, so you, do you do lists or do you use it as just uh, columns that you're, you're um, well, monitoring? Well, I personally use it with as columns with like users and also by subject lines or hashtags depending on like kind of what's going on. Okay. Um, I don't really use the list feature very much with Twitter, but I could see how it could be helpful. Yeah, the list could be really helpful. And you can make those private so that it's just a collection for you to understand uh, and, and to know about. Or you can make them public, especially if you feel like it's a, if it's a public service to the school community to have this listing of all of the professors, for example, or all of the administration on those different lists. Who else used it? Did anybody else raise their hand for that? Okay. 
So we really recommend for monitoring TweetDeck. And you can uh, s establish these columns as you like. Uh, you can have them search uh, by hashtag. You can have them search by usernames. Um, and this is really great uh, to in breaking news situations. So you can see what uh, people are talking about and what, what kind of information might need to be verified. Uh, Facebook offers two internal um, uh, ways to monitor. One is Facebook Signal, um, and it also searches uh, Facebook and Instagram. You have to be a newsroom to get access to it, but since you guys are newsrooms, you should apply and get access to it so you can see uh, the types of information that may be uh, starting to trend online, uh, so you know what kind of news people are are talking about. There's also CrowdTangle, and this is just for Facebook, um, and it's really good for monitoring breaking news. So. What, what you want to look at uh, for <clears throat> photos and videos that are uploaded online is the motivation. Is the person an eyewitness? Did they just happen to be stopping by and, and now they are part of the news cycle? Are they an activist? Do they have a position on the news? <clears throat> or is it a reporter who also has, uh, who was there on the scene and, and wants people to know more information? Um, each newsroom or many newsrooms uh, have uh, a stance on whether or not they'll accept activist information, meaning I'm thinking Amnesty International, um, Human Rights Watch, uh, PETA, for example. They all, all of these news or all of these nonprofits have news outlets now, basically, and they do send out information, but it's always from their point of view, what they want, how they want to see the world, and it's okay to use that information so long as your newsroom has a policy and you act on that. But just know it's very important to know why somebody might have posted the photo that they posted. So as I mentioned, uh, desktop, if you can get more desktops, the better uh, to be able to do these simultaneous uh, comparisons um, and also to be able to monitor uh, what people are talking about. <clears throat> and I should say too that for, um, the U.S. Is, at, is, is in a luxury position to be able to work on desktops. Most of the world looks at information and, and tries to verify stuff on, social, on, um, on smartphones. So the fact that we're able to see this level of granularity is, is uh, unique. So my, I don't know about you guys, but my, uh, my Chromebook or my Chrome uh, browser has a series of plugins up at the top. And a lot of them are for um, my social monitoring. So part of it is re uh, Rev Eye reverse image search. Um, you can do uh, several, um, <clears throat> you can, uh, with one click, you can do a reverse image search, which makes that really handy. There's also the Wayback Machine, uh, which is really useful when, when a website comes up and you think, that doesn't look like the original. And you can go and, s and see how far back does it go. A reliable news source is often has years worth of archived pages. It often doesn't change so dramatically in looks. So sometimes uh, when the New York Times gets a, gets a facelift, it's still going to be sort of, uh, it's not going to be BuzzFeed. And it'll be very obvious that it's its own um, unique place. Uh, we've also uh, developed a Chrome plugin um, for a visual verification guide. I'll go over that more in detail um, with the next slide. There's also Invid, uh, which it, um, what they do is basically take all of these tools and put them together as a shortcut, um, and that really helps. I know that journalists who use this often say that it's the thing that they've been needing, aside from a one-stop service to verify something, if, if something is true or not. Um, there's Google Translate, which is a really great plugin to have, um, obviously, for trans translating pages, and Session Buddy to save and edit groups of browser tabs. So this is our uh, tool, News Check. So it basically takes you through our visual verification guide. And the visual verification guides are available there for video and photo. Um, the links are there for you. If you just want a paper, sometimes it's nice to have the paper. What this one does is you can verify an image or video. And it will take you through these questions that you see on the far left. You know, are you looking at the original? Do you know who captured it? It'll take you through our five verification steps. And then it will, um, it will uh, say that it's uh, the percentage of which it's verified. And you can also get code, which is posted on our website, so it's publicly available, and is a third party. So you can say, look, we checked through this. These were the steps that we took. And uh, you can see from a third party website that this is, um, 
that we're proud enough of the work that we did that we will we can post it here for you to see. Um, I think one of the things that uh, the public really has been itching for is more transparency in reporting, and this kind of work really does give that transparency. So, what do you need? Well, we have an online course that we'd be happy for you guys to sign into. It's a one-hour version, or we have a five-unit course that takes you through the very basics all the way through geolocation. You can learn at your own pace. And that's my boss, Claire Wardle, who got this whole thing started. And this is a list of key tools for verification and browser extensions. I don't know if you guys, do you want me to, yeah, wait for your photos. And I, I can also um, make sure that this is distributed, distributed to you with links um, after this. Uh, the other thing we should talk about are the ethical considerations when using uh, social, <clears throat> social posts or things from social posts and how to contact. So the tough thing about this, you have to do this oftentimes in 140 characters because if you just pounce on someone uh, and you know, say, can I have the photo? And you don't, they, oftentimes people don't see your six other posts that are like, are you okay? And can you tell me more about this? Um, can we use this? They see that first one where you're like, hey, I want this photo. So the first thing you should do in 140 characters or less is ask about their well-being. Um, explained how you found them and the point of contact, that you saw their, their post on Twitter and that you're interested in using it. You want to say who, where you're from and give your work email or phone number and remembering that if it's not a direct message that this is public. Um, <clears throat> you want to explain that the info, information that they share will strengthen the story uh, and you don't want to participate in what we call a dog pile of requests, especially that are public. Uh, and when you're talking to them directly, ask if they have other footage that they haven't posted. That would be more exclusive for your newsroom to have. So when you're working with eyewitness media, you want to think about the intent. Is the person a reporter? Is the person uh, an innocent bystander? Is the person um, an activist who really wants people to know a particular part of this uh, issue or event? Uh, you want to get consent of the person, uh, <clears throat> and oftentimes, especially large news organizations, send people a wall of all of the rights and explain it to them. Uh, the problem is if somebody has just been in a traumatic event, they often don't know what they're talking about. So as much as you can use very familiar phrases and lose the jargon, people will, I think, be able to understand what they're really giving up when they um, say okay. And the impact, is this uh, photo or video that you've taken um, and to use and you've had consent and you understand the intent, is the impact uh, worth it? You know, is this uh, going to build and add to your story? <clears throat> the other thing about uh, the using online images and photos is, or photos and videos is that people don't understand copyright and they don't understand who the copyright holder is. So is the person who uploaded um, the content the copyright holder or the person in the photo or the person pushing the camera button. Who thinks it's A for the copyright holder? Anybody think the copyright holder is the person who uploaded the content? Okay. How about the person in the photo? Are they the copyright holder? How about the person pushing the camera button? Oh. And the person who owns the camera? Okay, it's C, you guys are great. So it is the person, I could be holding it um, and somebody else pushes the button and maybe it's your phone and we're taking a photo of this group, but uh, it's the person who pushes the, the red button who is the um, copyright holder and that's the person you wanna go to. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a terror attack uh, down um, in Battery Park in New York City uh, in the fall and um, they got all, the, the news organizations got a lot of uh, photo, photos and videos from people and testimony uh, about what had happened, uh, but they didn't ask the right person. They asked the person in the, in the photo and the video, not the person who had taken it. So um, they, and the person who was in the photo didn't know that they didn't have the copyright. So it's, it's really up to us to know both sides of that and to be able to explain it to people that I know you're in it, but I want to know who, who took it. So the button pressure um, on the photo owns all copyrights. The copyright is held by the person who created the image or video, not the person who uploaded it. 
and embedding the content without permission is not, is not a copyright infringement, but embedding content that has been posted without the consent of the copyright holder is likely to be an infringement. Ask the uploader. Sometimes, uh, especially US newsrooms say, well, it's fair use because it's a breaking news situation. We didn't have time. That will only get you so far. <laughs> Um, so you want to make sure that you do due, due diligence uh, to securing the copyright. Scraping or removing a piece of content uh, from its original platform and running it as your own is also copyright infringement. So the people who are making all the money on those uh, disaster videos uh, are, are stealing, basically, and they're also profiting, so it's like a double theft. Uh, request permission to use the content um, in clear, uncomplicated language. And as I said, fair use uh, can only go so far. Uh, so, copyright truisms, the button pusher is king, and copyright varies country to country. Yeah. How does it, how does it work when um, newsrooms like the New York Times embed like a tweet from Donald Trump in the middle of their story? So how does that fit into copyright issues? So that's, um, Twitter will accept you embedding uh, their, their tweets as long as the, the person has a public account. Um, but what they couldn't do is take a photo of that and, and embed the photo of the tweet in there. Now, this all changes if he said something, deleted the tweet, and somebody has a photo of it. Um, then you would go to that person who, took the, who, who had the screenshot and ask them for that permission. So all of that is, uh, it, it, the embeds work and uh, work well for newsrooms. Yeah. So can you explain why the photo doesn't work? Like, you, you said we can embed the tweet, and that's fine. It's that, that doesn't break the terms of service with Twitter. But the photo does. But a, a, a screenshot of it would. It just, it just breaks it, that's, that's the reason yeah. why. There's no yeah, way. and here's something else that sort of hasn't caught up with the digital age is uh, ABC News can use, uh, can embed videos in their web pages. They cannot run it on the nightly news without clearing rights for that. So it's something that hasn't caught up and is really frustrating and it's frustrating for people who work in verification um, to not be able to have the same rights and permissions across all their platforms. And so that's something that needs to be updated with, with the laws. Yeah, it is crazy. But we need more people like you to say that so that things will change hopefully. Yeah. So you said, but if so, let's say the tweet was deleted and you're running a story that you said tweet, but then it was deleted before you posted the story, but you have a screenshot of it, then you can use that? I mean, people do, and I think in, especially if it's, if it's coming from a, a, a notable public figure, I think that that's fair game. No. So the other thing I wanted to talk to you guys about are our experimental journalism projects. Uh, what we really want to do is bring more newsrooms together. Uh, for our cross-check project, it was a public-facing website, and 37 newsrooms in France uh, verified information around the French election. And it required three newsrooms to sign off on it. So with each debunk that we wrote, we, we wrote 67 debunks. With each one, we had at least three logos, and we tested to see if the public had a better perception of, uh, if, they, if they thought it was more authoritative, um, and they, they could trust it if there was more than one newsroom who had signed off. And the results um, were really positive. I often wonder, too, that if uh, they had gotten a different uh, election result, uh, if our project would have been considered such a success, but that's something that we will continue to, um, to test. And we're also, I'm leading the, the Brazilian election project that we're doing, and what's been amazing to me is how similar Brazil is to the U.S. Uh, the record media distrust, we're neck and neck at 42% with uh, the U.S. and Brazil is 43 and the fear of disinformation. We are in the same block there as uh, Brazil is in terms of uh, the public just not knowing what um, to trust anymore. <clears throat> the other thing that we're doing and what we've moved from, just from verifying, which we think is, is critical, but also looking at, um, at uh, where this information is coming from. So we're looking at discovery phase. Uh, and we're looking at, in particular, the open network is what we all play in. Uh, the closed network are things that we join, and the dark web is by invitation only. So what we're talking about with the dark web is we're talking like Gab um, and the, the closed chat rooms. Um, so what we're looking at here is the, um, the origination of the content um, that is, is uh, disinformation is hatched as a, as a campaign um, on closed groups. Um, and then there's a strategic communication plan about it. There's a hashtag brigade, brigade uh, that's deployed 
um, and then they, they start to seed this information, the bad content, uh, to um, mainstream media. When it's, once it hits Twitter and Facebook, um, then it's kind of out there for the uh, mainstream media, and then it gets amplified on both sides, whether it's uh, the mainstream media saying that this is fooled, this is a, this is a piece of wrong information, but that they continue to uh, talk about it in ways that, that gives, uh, doesn't tell people that it's wrong, <laughs> or um, the uh, chat rooms take over and that they amplify it even further. Um, and where we're really looking at for our election, upcoming election projects is to stop uh, this information at stage two, whether it's talking to newsrooms who are part of our partnership to talk about what we call strategic silence, where we agree not to report on something because we know we're getting fooled. Um, one of the things that happened recently was with the Parkland shooter. Uh, they, there was a group that uh, said, told a mainstream, well, told an ABC News reporter that, uh, that, this, that the shooter was part of a neo-Nazi group in Florida. The parallel conversation is, hey guys, let's fool this reporter into thinking that this guy was a neo-Nazi. So <clears throat> what we want to do is to understand that, that conversation as it's happening and then to tell people who are part of our network, don't report on this. He was not a part of a neo-Nazi group. And if we show our five steps of verification, we hope people will listen. <clears throat> so what we learned from our French election project, uh, most of all, was that newsrooms need to have a 4chan reporter or somebody who's covering the dark web in a really meaningful way as if it were as important as the city county be beat or the cops and fire. Um, that's where we see the future of this. So I can take questions if you guys have them. Okay. Uh, thank you guys. I appreciate it.